All right. Now it's time. Hey, everybody. Good morning, and thank you all for coming out. I want to thank the scale organizers for completely eliminating the Sunday morning hangover slot. I've had it before, and it's not a lot of fun, and I'm glad to be rid of it. My name is Jeff Gelbach, and I've been doing network monitoring longer than is probably healthy. I got my start in the discipline in 2000 while working as a wide area network management engineer for the NASA Integrated Services Network. From there, I went to work doing consulting and software engineering for a company called Concord Communications, which was a proprietary network management vendor. Um, after being made redundant in a merger, we uh, got hoovered up by CA, as so many have over the years, um, I uh, worked for a couple of telcos where I deployed OpenNMS, got to know the system a little bit, and uh, got involved with the fantastic user community, some of whom are uh, still either working with us as uh, coworkers or just as members of the broader community. I started fixing bugs in my spare time in the software and got to know the code and hired on with the OpenNMS group in 2007, and that's where I've been to this day, so you do the math. My roles at OpenNMS have included end user support, consulting, solutions architecture, sales engineering, and most recently product management. I'm now the product manager for the OpenNMS Horizon ecosystem, which includes the Horizon and Meridian distributions of OpenNMS, plus some supporting components. This world is really good for me because I can see my work making a difference, and that is very important to my psyche. It's also good for the products because there's no longer any danger of me writing code. Before I get underway here, uh, I want to acknowledge a bug in my talk. I'm aware that the, much of the terminology I'm using today is a little bit um, cited normative, so suggestions on how to make this better are uh, appreciated. I'd like the talk to feel more inclusive. Please see me afterward if you have ideas. All right. So here's my agenda. I'm here to sell you today on the idea that the network still matters, despite the fact that it's increasingly hidden from our view. I'll get into the elements of network management, or network monitoring, as it's more popularly referred to these days. And I'll touch on a few ways that OpenNMS approaches this very fun discipline. I also aim to convince you that you should care about NetFlow which is a protocol that's been around since the mid-1990s, or at least that you should care about some of the successor protocols or, and work-alike protocols that have come along since. As a terminology note, I'll be using NetFlow to refer to all protocols in this family as a group. When I'm talking about NetFlow proper, I'll suffix the term with either V5 or V9 to refer to a specific protocol version. Let me pause here for a second and ask for a show of hands. How many of you have used or still use NetFlow or a similar protocol in your day-to-day -day life? Pretty decent representation here. OK, thanks. That's going to help me adjust the nerd level a little bit uh, when I get into some of the more deep dive stuff on how we added flow support to OpenNMS. There is a lot to cover here, and I'm not going to try to put too many of you to sleep doing it. I'll also talk a little bit about what the future may hold for flows in the OpenNMS product portfolio. So let's get on into it. All right, now, I do mean to convince you that the network matters. However, I'm a big fan of considering all the available evidence, not just the evidence that supports my own conclusions. So I'm going to begin by acknowledging some facts about the state of the world in 2022. First, the in-house data center is in sharp decline overall. Um, unless you work at AWS <laughs> or GCP or Azure or AliCloud, you're probably not doing new data center projects in your work. Second, who knows what the hell is up with the physical office? It's so up in the air, it's anybody's guess. Um, just anecdotally, at OpenNMS, where I work, the US and Europe staff are still 100% home-based, and they have been since March of 2020. 
in Canada, our Ottawa office has found a hybrid protocol that works so far for them, but that could get disrupted at any point. So we really just don't know what the physical office will look like. Also, the last mile is changing. There are developments like 5G and SD-WAN that are dramatically altering that landscape. Even if you set aside the shift toward work from home, it's going to be a while before the dust settles in this arena. Right? We don't necessarily have the, the comfort of assuming that there's glass or copper coming into where the users are. Also, cloud native deployment is really changing the game uh, as far as like what technologies the people coming up in the industry today are familiar with. And it's really threatening to make this yeah, uh, into the new this. All right, so these facts are all acknowledged. However, magical as it feels to type Terraform apply and see your code become infrastructure right before our eyes in our terminal window, the evidence we have suggests that our universe is unfortunately devoid of actual magic. At some point, some device is moving ones and zeros around, and that's what makes our infrastructure go. And that's what makes our users able to interact with the apps that we're deploying. This is why we do monitoring, right? Absent an idea of where those bits are coming and going and what they look like qualitatively as well as quantitatively, it's really hard to form a clear picture of our infrastructure's health and capacity. So this brings us to the why behind monitoring. Now I grabbed this image from the OpenNMS Twitter feed on Valentine's Day of this year. Um, this is our mascot, Ulf. I've got him actually right here in the plush. Um, Ulf eats bugs for breakfast and he hearts monitoring. And this isn't really a tie-in to anything except that heart is in the title of this talk, so it seemed appropriate. All right. Now, I contend that network visibility is at the heart of the discipline of network monitoring, and everything monitoring, in fact, and that it will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. The visibility of the network enables us to understand what's actually going on. Application level metrics, logging, tracing, these are all indispensable parts of the monitoring ecosystem, and they're super important parts of the picture. But if you add network visibility, it's like turning on the lights in a darkened room where we're fumbling around trying to figure out what all of these other inputs mean just by feel alone. So let's break down network management, which is the sort of old school discipline that old guys like me practice, uh, into the discipline that contains monitoring as we practice it, a little more focused, and down into its constituent parts. Um, there are several bodies over the years that have put forward different models to describe network management capabilities. Here are a couple of, I don't know how many of you know either or both of these, but the OSI FCAPS model is sort of the most widely known way to break down network management capabilities. It's the one that I learned decades ago, back in 2000, uh, and it's the one that we've historically used in our work at OpenNMS to guide our thinking as we evolve the code base that we are fortunate to be stewards of. The areas of FCAPs in which we try to play are chiefly fault management and performance management, with just a little tiny slice of configuration management that we recently added. Now, folks who work on the telecoms industry side of the house might be more familiar with the ETOM FAB model. Uh, which breaks down into just three areas. And it's really convenient to work with the FAB model because in that one, all the disciplines of fault performance and config management roll up under the assurance part, that A in the middle there. But really, same thing, just different ways to break it down. So here's a little bit more about the three categories of FCAPs where OpenNMS, where I work, plays. Um, and what our corresponding capabilities look like in those areas. First area, fault management. Everybody's seen a room like this on TV. Maybe you've seen it in person if you work in the industry, right? Fault management concerns itself essentially with knowing when something worth noting has happened in the network and conveying that knowledge to the right people. 
That's it. That's what fault management's all about. Now, sometimes that means a fancy room full of humans and workstations like this one, um, but that's shifting as previously mentioned. One of the typical inputs into fault management as a discipline is what I'll call unsolicited external messages. This grouping includes SNMP traps, syslog messages, JSON format messages from some message broker topic, and even quasi-standard mechanisms, things like the event interchange format, or EIF. We support all these mechanisms in OpenNMS that I've just named. Another important input to fault management is synthetic transactions. These are performed by software, and the point of them is to simulate a real user's interactions with the real network and the real applications that it enables. If we see something go down robotically, we say, hey, this thing went down, somebody might want to look into it. OpenNMS dedicates a whole subsystem to these inputs. We call it the polar. Other systems call it something different. Finally, um, evaluating different kinds of time series data against thresholds is another important way that many systems increase the value of their fault management subsystem. Ours is no exception. I'll touch on this um, more in just a moment. All right, I'm going to make a, just a very brief stop off to talk about config management, uh, which concerns itself with wrangling device and application configurations, keeping track of how they've changed over time, and often also with applying changes to those configurations according to some kind of code-based mechanism. Think Ansible and you're on the right track, right? That's the most popular config management platform that we're likely to be dealing with today. We're not trying to be Ansible. Uh, we're dipping just a toe with device config back backup capabilities that we added to the Horizon 30 release earlier this year in 2022. Uh, so we can go out and grab configs from your network devices and compare them historically. So you can see here we've got a little bit of a diff. Uh, we're not trying to go out and make changes. We're not, not trying to get that fancy, but it's really nice to be able to see the history. All right, let's move into performance management. This deals in quantifiable measurements over time. In practical terms, in today's terminology, it boils down to what we call metrics. It's just time series data, right? It's numeric. This time series data might be evaluated against thresholds as well. And that can generate events which feed back into the fault management subsystem. This can happen either internally or externally in a separate piece of software. Um, in our case, we do it internally, but in a distributed way in a lot of cases. Performance management these days, the getting of these time series metrics really breaks down into two high-level approaches. Uh, there's what I'll call the pull mode, which uses a protocol like SNMP. Uh, could also use a protocol like WS Management or calls to a REST API um, or some, uh, some other mechanism where the monitoring platform reaches out periodically, right, on a timed schedule, asks a question of a device or an agent, and then stores the result. Um, it's all bucketized on time window boundaries. There's also a, in, in recent years, there's uh, been an increase in the popularity of what I'll call push mode for getting these metrics in. And that's one in which the monitoring system just sits back, chilling, and it waits for metrics to arrive via some streaming telemetry mechanism. That mechanism could be Juniper's JTI, Juniper's telemetry interface, uh, Cisco's Nexus streaming protocol. There's a standards-based mechanism called OpenConfig. Um, and there are also some message broker-based situations where uh, it can work similar to a streaming telemetry. The performance management subsystem of OpenNMS supports both of these models, including all of the transports that I've listed here. Now, most of our popular open source monitoring products stop there. But performance management also encompasses something that we'll call flows. Flow management is often also called traffic management, and it's a subdiscipline of performance management which answers the essential question, which hosts are talking to each other about what and when, and at what data volumes. Now, importantly here, we're not talking about open flow. That's a different thing, and I'll touch on that in a couple of moments. 
So let's get into the family of flow management protocols that's often collectively called NetFlow. Um, terminology note again here, NetFlow, the, the word NetFlow may or may not be a registered trademark of Cisco. Hard to tell these days. They may have abandoned it. It's become a generic trademark in any case. Uh, so as a reminder, I'll use that word to talk about all the flow export protocols that are based on NetFlow or are successors of it or work in a similar way. NetFlow V5 was the original NetFlow. It's proprietary to Cisco and it first came on the scene in 1996. It's not very extensible or sophisticated for that matter and it supports only UDP as the network transport. But it does solve some basic problems of network traffic visibility. Now, fun fact, some of you may know this already, but the flow export part of NetFlow 5, which is basically all of NetFlow 5 that we use these days, was kind of an afterthought. Cisco was working on a separate project meant to optimize routing and switching in the inter-network operating system. Um, so they just added on this flow export thing as a nice aside and it took off into its own whole discipline. The successor to NetFlow v5 is NetFlow v9 and that came out in 2013. Um, sorry, in 2004. It's still proprietary to Cisco, but it is much more extensible than NetFlow v5. 2013 is when NetFlow v9 gave way to IPFIX, which is actually a standards-based protocol, not proprietary to Cisco. Um, it's very similar to NetFlow v9 in many ways. Um, it is a bit more extensible and has more security features, which is super important these days. And it also supports additional kinds of transports, including TCP and SCTP. There's also SFlow, which is a multi-vendor effort spearheaded by a vendor called Inmon. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. There are some also RANs here too. Uh, some Juniper equipment supports a Juniper proprietary flow expert protocol called JFlow. Huawei and HPE devices support something called NetStream, which seems very similar to NetFlow v9, but is not interoperable with it. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about SDN and SD-WAN. Some of these platforms may support either IP fix or SFlow, or they may have their own proprietary methods of exporting flow records. I'm not going to get into those in any depth today, but we are keeping a keen eye on this space and in principle, we can add support for any emerging flow export protocols that the market demands. All right. So what's in a flow record? Flow record is the building block of flow management. At base, a flow record is just a summary of some network traffic which got sent by a flow exporter. To find our terms here, that exporter is typically a piece of software running on a router or a switch uh, one that's equipped to inspect the packets that it's forwarding and switching and look at the source and destination IP addresses, source destination port, layer 3 protocol, and some other attributes to arrive at a tuple that identifies an exchange of data between two nodes. As the flow tuples build up, the flow-enabled device fills its flow cache with summarized data, right over here in the cache. Uh, it's filling its cache with those summarized data, and when some triggering event occurs, maybe it's a timer expiring after a time window in which no new data has been seen on that flow record, the flow-enabled device sends a packet with all of that summarized information to a collector. So now we've got exporter, collector. The collector is some piece of software that's capable of receiving and processing and persisting the information in those flow packets. Um, those, that could be OpenNMS. There are also things like CFlowD running around out there. And there's, of course, a wealth of free and proprietary options in the market that have this kind of capability. Flow-enabled devices tend to be higher-end ones. Uh, your average consumer device probably doesn't have support for NetFlow or NetFlow-like protocols um, unless you're running a custom firmware like PFSense or OpenSense, which probably a lot of you are. So again, in a nutshell, the flow-enabled device constantly inspects traffic that it sees on the network, summarizes it up into flow records, 
and then sends those flow records in the form of flow packets to a flow collector. All right, uh, this is a super nerdy comparison of NetFlow v5 and its successors, NetFlow v9 and IPFix, in case you're curious about how they stack up. Grab a photo now if you want one, because I'm about to click past it. All right, uh, there is also SFlow, as I promised. Let's get into what SFlow does. It is an open multi-vendor effort led by a company called Inmon way back in the day. Famously, the technologists at CERN have used SFlow to gain visibility of the network that powers what has been characterized as the largest machine ever built, built by humans, the Large Hadron Collider. So it's got some bona fides behind it. I'll have a little bit more detail on SFlow and how it stacks up momentarily. All right, so let's rewind for a second, and I promise I'm not, not going to do this for every protocol. I'm not, like I said, not trying to put you all to sleep. Um, but let's look at what's inside of a NetFlow v5 export packet, since that's sort of our baseline. We can see here that it is a v5 packet, right? I've exploded the part that says protocol version 5, so you don't have to squint as much. Um, and here are the various fields as d dissected by Wireshark. I'm going to gloss over much of this, and I'll just zoom in on the most important fields. So the first two here are the conversation partners. That's the source and destination IP addresses of the two hosts in the conversation. In NetFlow 5, it's IPv4 only. I think it's the same in V9, but IPFix does support IPv6. There's also the SNMP if index, which is just a layer two network interface identifier of the input interface. And that appears alongside these two addresses. Further down are the source and destination ports. If applicable, they'll, they'll be zeroed out if the IP protocol in question doesn't have the notion of ports. The IP protocol here is identified by its number. Uh, in this case, it's 6, which is the protocol number for TCP. So we know that this is a TCP flow record we're looking at. We also get a measure of the data volume that was exchanged by those conversation partners. That's in the octets field. And then from the duration field, we can see how long the exchange was ongoing, it measured in seconds. Together with the five items listed above, we now have the essential seven-part tuple of any flow record. This is going to be basically the same for any flow protocol. Those seven things are what you need to know. Now at the very, very bottom, you see this tiny little thing called padding, um, which in NetFlow 5 was marked as reserved for future use. Some implementations use these bytes to differentiate between ingress traffic and egress traffic, so you can get a notion of flow direction, um, maybe. It's, it's kind of dicey sometimes. Um, later flow protocols have explicitly accounted for flow direction uh, in NetFlow v9 and later. All right, so here it is again, zoomed back out with all of the important fields listed. This is the time to take a photo if you want one. All right, cool. So as previously illustrated, NetFlow v5 is pretty simple. I'm going to talk about the differences between v5 and v9 here. Again, not trying to put anybody to sleep. But v9 essentially just comes with more richness to it. v9 of NetFlow introduces such things as templates and flow sets, as well as option templates. And all of these things really just go into making the protocol more efficient over the wire. It makes it significantly less chatty, because instead of repeating information, you can just use a template to say, that thing I told you about in the last one, same stuff again. Um, but this savings does come at the cost of some complexity. And as you might imagine, we have found and fixed a fair number of bugs just in our handling of templates in NetFlow v9 and later. The takeaway from this slide is really just that NetFlow v9 introduces some important, significant improvements, and I'm going to leave it at that. All right. Now, we've also talked about a couple of protoc flow protocols here, so let's get into how these protocols compare to other traffic measurement options, including SNMP and SFlow as well. Everybody's probably got SNMP going already, right? That's kind of table stakes if you're doing network monitoring. Um, when it comes to traffic volume, SNMP interface counter data is necessary, um, but I argue it's not sufficient for great visibility if you really care about the character of your traffic. We get to know the total amount of traffic through an interface during a given period of time, 
but we get no visibility of the characteristics of that traffic with SNMP alone. Uh, the same is true of interface counter data that we might gather via any other protocol like a REST API or streaming telemetry or any other similar mechanism. Now this is a problem that the NetFlow family of flow export protocols can address for us. We already touched on NetFlow v5 and its successors, but there is also SFlow, which I promised I would get to in some depth. SFlow takes a different approach to NetFlow. Instead of summarizing the traffic and maintaining counters in a cache, SFlow just statistically samples packets. Um, it might look at one in a thousand packets, just look at the header info on that, and it sends on that summary information to the collector. So the collector can take a statistical approach to interpolating what the actual character of that traffic looks like. And you can get the same general type of visibility with the same general degree of, of reliability, but it is important when you're dealing with SFlow to remember that the underlying mechanisms are quite different and there's some statistics happening behind a curtain uh, to arrive at the conclusions that you see. SFlow also has some facilities for streaming other kinds of system level and interface level data. And for this reason, SFlow qualifies as a streaming telemetry protocol, um, even for non-flow data. We won't frequently see it used that way, but once in a while we do bump into that. Finally, one last thing that bears mentioning is that NetFlow is not at all the same thing as OpenFlow. I said I would get to this, and here we are. Um, OpenFlow probably has been talked about by a few other speakers here this weekend. It is a software-defined network switching protocol, right? It's the protocol that SDN switches use to talk to their controllers um, to make decisions about what a given flow, which means something different in, uh, in the SDN world, should uh, be disposed of. So just take care about that. All right, so moving on from what a flow is, let's talk about what the OpenNMS platform provides now in the realm of flows. Plenty of products offer flow monitoring, but it's a somewhat rare capability among open source products, at least ones that, that try to do many things. Since we're committed to making all the capabilities of OpenNMS available under an open source license, the flow subsystem had to fit inside those lines as well. All right, so we have added support over the past few major releases of OpenNMS Horizon for collecting, persisting, visualizing, and now also thresholding performance data. We support quite a few flow export protocols, including NetFlow v5, NetFlow v9, IPFIX, and SFlow, all the ones that I've just gone over, um, and I think some other ones besides. We enrich the flow data with inventory data about the nodes that are under monitoring in OpenNMS so that you can see the flows associated with nodes that actually mean something to you, not just an IP address. So you can actually anchor the flows onto the nodes that you're looking at in your daily life. We have a flow classifier, which enables users to write rules to identify flows on, uh, based on their attributes. So you have custom protocols uh, in your environment that are going to be seen on the wire. You can write your own classifier rules for those. Sort those rules into buckets. Uh, we ship a, a ton of canned ones, and users can write their own using a straightforward syntax if they need to do it. When you visualize your custom app traffic in the dashboards, you can see the flow labeled in a way that's meaningful to your organization. So instead of just seeing UDP 6789, you can see awesome custom app that we make. We also provide impressive horizontal scale for flow data. Um, we have seen action in some very large environments with sustained flow rates exceeding 300,000 flows per second. Now in the interest of full disclosure, it is not easy to achieve this level of scale. Frankly, that's true of any platform. But with proper system sizing and tuning, it is repeatable and it is being used at these scales in anger at real sites in the real world. It helps to have a team who feed and care for the more unruly stack components, a data team for like care and feeding of your Elasticsearch and Kafka, which we'll come to momentarily. We also provide enterprise reporting in OpenNMS, and that includes PDF delivery via email of any flow report. This capability is something that we built specifically for the Flows project, but it works with all other kinds of reports too. 
uh, including non-flow dashboards. Finally, we offer visibility in the form of top K, or some people call it top N statistics. Uh, these are broken down by interface, application, host, and conversation. Uh, and we offer filtering based on quality of service switches. Uh, so you can ask questions like, what are the five applications that are using most bandwidth on this particular link that's been saturated for the past 15 minutes? Get a very quick and detailed answer on that. So this is what our flow visualization tool actually looks like. As you probably guessed, we're using Grafana as the framework for this visualization of flows. And uh, with the help of a data source plugin that we maintain, Grafana is able to retrieve flow records from the OpenNMS core to get and present that, code, that uh, flow data. We'll see a bit about uh, how this data looks under the hood in a moment. We provide controls in this dashboard uh, to choose among multiple data sources. So if you happen to have multiple instances of OpenNMS in your enterprise, you can switch among them. Uh, we also offer ways to choose which node and which interface the flows that you're looking at are associated to. There is a picker for the differentiated services code point value, uh, which becomes important work where quality of service is enforced and measured. This panel is showing the throughput by application at the top left, and we can see that in graph form in the top left panel there. Uh, we also have it in a tabular representation at the top right there. It, I know it's probably pretty difficult to read from out there. Um, but we can zoom around on the application traffic in that top left panel. Uh, we can see it in tabular form. It's exactly the same data, just summarized. And then we can zoom in on a particular time period um, in that SNMP panel in the second row. That's our, just our traffic volume data, right? That's what we get via SNMP. So if you see an interesting shaped spike in that SNMP traffic level data, you can zoom in using Grafana's zoom capabilities, and it locks in the same time frame for the application classification traffic. So you can see exactly down to the sub-second level even, um, what the traffic is that accounts for that spike. Um, this lets you really get into isolating the applications and the conversations that are responsible for that traffic volume. Because the flow data is not bucketized on like a one minute or a five minute boundary the way the SNMP collected data is, um, you can actually go way deeper in the flow data than you can on the SNMP data really, really powerful way to visualize this stuff. All right. Now, I did say I'm not going to try to put you to sleep, but here's a block diagram. <laughs> All right. So let's just take this uh, as quick as we can. On the left is the router, <coughs> excuse me, the router or the switch that is exporting the flows. Uh, that's happening via whatever protocols you're using. And that's coming into a minion host. Um, you probably don't know what a minion is, so I'll tell you. Minion is an OpenNMS component which provides edge visibility for an OpenNMS instance. Um, that includes flow ingest, but also all of its other inbound and outbound capabilities. You can run a whole fleet of minions um, either on your own using Ansible or whatever you prefer, uh, or you can also get uh, an appliance product offering from us, which helps reduce the administrative overhead involved in running that many minion systems. Minion receives the flow packets. It does some parsing and enrichment. And after forwarding the resulting document to Kafka, um, it's floating around out there in the Kafka environment. Uh, Kafka, if you don't know, is a message broker, but so much more than just a message broker. You can also use ActiveMQ. But uh, if you're doing this at big scales, Kafka is probably going to be a better experience. Now, the enrichment currently done by Minion takes the form of reverse DNS lookups. Um, this is just looking up the conversation partner's host names based on the IP addresses. Now, why do we do this on Minion at the edge? Well, the answer to that is where you do the DNS reverse resolution matters, right? Out at the edge, the DNS resolver that's configured may give you a different reverse, a different pointer record versus one if you do the same lookup in the core. So we just roll with the assumption that you probably want those IP addresses resolved to host names as close to where the traffic happened as you can get it. 
Okay, so we've got this uh, we've got this flow of traffic onto Kafka. Also connected to Kafka is one or more Sentinel hosts. You don't know what a Sentinel is, probably. Sentinel is another OpenNMS component. It's a workload scaling node um, that can host several different functions that would otherwise be shouldered by the core. In this case, Sentinel is doing further enrichment, including application classification and inventory matching, as well as tagging the nodes and interfaces back in the core of OpenNMS to indicate that there's flow data available for those interfaces at that point in time. Sentinel works to forward the further enriched documents back onto Kafka, and it goes back for another spin. Now, there's an optional piece shown here. Um, it's a component that we're provisionally calling Nephron. I'll get into what its job is later, but you just basically need to know that it runs inside an Apache Flink cluster. It does a bunch of streaming analytics, then persists the results into an Elasticsearch cluster. This is where the flow record documents actually end up coming to rest, is in Elasticsearch. You may have noticed that we also have an open metrics TSDB down here at the bottom right in the form of Cortex. This component currently complements Elasticsearch rather than replacing it, and I'll get into that in a few moments. All right. So streaming flows in, in the real world and scaling them, um, it gets big, right? This is what flow data looks like at scale in a real world customer environment. Uh, this happened, I think these are from the end of 2019. It's a little hard to read probably. But these are just indices in an Elasticsearch cluster. We're looking at them in Kibana. This is how we store the flow records. Um, in this environment, we had 800 different routers exploiting flows across the enterprise at one of our customers, most of them with flow processing enabled only on the internet-facing interface, though a few did have it on multiple interfaces. This resulted in about 6 million flows per interface per hour. This data is going to add up fast. Um, so here's a list of the various Elasticsearch indices that hold these flow record documents for a short period of time. You can see that they're bucketized by day and by hour and they're named accordingly. This strategy is configurable, so you can make the buckets smaller or bigger as your needs dictate. Um, so all flows for a given hour are in a single index here. That shakes out to around 140 million documents in the Elasticsearch cluster, filling about 80 gigabytes for each hour. You can imagine how this adds up over the course of three or six or 12 months. Um, so there are challenges. Uh, the volume of flow records also in this environment has grown significantly since we took this snapshot, and that has exposed some new additional challenges too. So with such large volumes of flow record documents, we began to run into performance challenges, especially when we would render the dashboards. Right? Performance for these dashboards was fine when the time range covered only 5 or 15 minutes but with larger time ranges such as the last day or the past week or 30 days, um, it, it really could, could slow down pretty badly, even though those time ranges are super helpful in getting a handle on the high-level trends of application traffic in your network. Um, but there's just so much computation going on to crunch and aggregate those flow records into such a long time frame. Uh, that the Elasticsearch queries become prone to timing out at those longer time scales. To render a flow report covering a 30-day period, we end up having to do these top-end calculations over about 4 billion flow record documents. Um, in some cases, we saw that these reports covered flows involving 120,000 unique hosts and 6,000 unique applications. For example, we might ask for the top five conversations among the 4 billion documents. And that's quite a lot of data for us to sift through and get the answers that we're looking for in real time or just in time. There are a number of different approaches to address this kind of challenge. Um, that includes pulling all that data into memory and using something like Druid to chew it for us. Um, expensive in terms of memory, uh, we ended up discarding that approach. And instead, we chose to build a streaming analytics pipeline and pre-compute some of those longer time period aggregations. That's what the Nephron project does. Um, so as the data comes through the, 
through the uh, streaming analytics pipeline, uh, we get a big speed up when we're presented with these very daunting, long time scale queries. This was the genesis of the Nephron project, which you saw boiled down to one tiny little box in that block diagram earlier. Um, its main purpose, Nephron's, is to make these dashboards quicker to load when they cover longer time periods. That's really all its job is. Um, it does come at the cost of considerable added complexity, though. If anybody's ever used Flink, um, it is its own kind of special beast. All right, so beyond the added complexity, streaming analytics introduces some, cha some challenges of its own at runtime. Um, anybody who's dealt with flows is already aware that things get weird if you don't have everything NTP'd, right? If all your clocks are not synchronized, the data looks weird and it's not reliable. But even when you get everything NTP'd properly, streaming processing introduces its own time lag concerns uh, because it's grouping every element by its time window. And while network sizes tend to vary, as far as we know, the speed of light is more or less fixed. So currently in Nephron, we use the Apache Beam streaming framework, which provides some nice help with these problems but it's still very difficult to engineer around them. Now, I am way past the limit of my competence talking about these concepts, so I'm just gonna move along at this point. All right, the future. Talking about the future is nice because nobody knows what it will look like and nobody actually expects us to get it right. We've accomplished quite a lot in OpenNMS with respect to flows, uh, but we're not content and we're continuing to push these capabilities forward. We already support the most popular standardized and quasi-standardized flow export protocols, but our flow architecture is designed to accommodate additional ones without the need to reinvent the wheel or do major architectural changes to the platform itself. Naturally, we would like to reduce the complexity of the solution. Finding a way to eliminate the need for an Apache Flink cluster would be a huge win. Um, don't know how feasible that's going to be, but we'll have top people working on it. Another thing that would be really nice is to make it possible to store flow record documents in Cortex or Mimir uh, without the need for Elasticsearch. The reason we still need Elasticsearch today is that flow data has extraordinarily high cardinality, right? You have to multiply together the number of possible values for every dimension, so source and IP address, not uh, source and destination IP address, source and destination port, IP protocol, all of those things, you multiply each of those things together by how many values of that thing you could possibly have to arrive at what level of cardinality you would need. And Cortex is just not currently able to cope with the high cardinalities that result from storing flow data in this way. Uh, so one approach we're considering is to work upstream in the Cortex project or potentially in Mimir, depending on what direction that project takes. And then finally, while this kind of solution will never be trivially easy to deploy, uh, we're taking sort of the same approach that everybody takes these days, uh, which is make a Kubernetes operator. Um, you know, push a button, get flows. Um, that work is actually happening right now. Speaking of the future, if you would like to be part of the future of OpenNMS, if you're a monitoring nerd like me with an interest in hacking on a platform that is committed to the open source way of doing things, I encourage you to check out what we're up to. Uh, we have a discourse board for long running discussions. Uh, you're going to find me and Dino and some of our colleagues on there. It's a great way to access help for sort of long running asynchronous conversations. We've also got a Mattermost that you can join. It's public. Anybody can make an account. So if you want to do real-time chat, that's where you can find all of us too. Our Jira is public. So if you find a bug or if you have a great idea for an enhancement, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, the bottom line is we would love to help turn your ideas about monitoring into open source code or docs or clever integrations. So I'll wrap up here. In years past, when somebody have, has stood up here from OpenNMS, flow support did not exist in our products at all. So I feel really good about what we've accomplished so far. We've gone from no flow support at all to quite a scalable solution that solves real network traffic visibility problems for some of the world's largest organizations. 
we still have a lot left to do, and I hope some of you will take an interest and join in the fun, because this stuff, let's be honest, if you're the right kind of person, is just fun. Uh, we are eager to have contributions in any form from the user community, so come see me after if you think you might want to hack on this stuff with us. I would like to thank the SCALE team once again for the excellent job that they've done in organizing this event amid so much uncertainty. I want to give special thanks to all of the volunteers, but extra special thanks to the AV team. Um, you all make this thing go. Thank you very much for uh, putting on this thing, and I appreciate you. So to all of you in the audience and watching the playback, thank you for your time and attention today. I think we have a few minutes left for questions, so please uh, lay them on me. I think Dino has an audience mic. Got one up here. Have you been have you been evaluating open search as an alternative to elastic search? I personally have been. I've gotten it to work. Um, yeah, there's a uh, there's a plugin called in the Elasticsearch or OpenSearch cluster to enable uh, storing records in the format that we use for uh, we call it the Drift plugin. Drift was just the engineering code name for the flows and streaming telemetry project. Um, but yeah, it, the uh, the plugin builds and installs in an OpenSearch cluster as long as you are able to line up like the open search version against the elastic search version if you've ever built these plugins you know that they're like even pickier than postgres about the version that they're built against uh, the good news there is we have just finished some work in the uh, engineering team to automate the builds of that plugin so open search should be just about as easy to work with as elastic search it's just not as well documented yet but yeah, we want this to be fully open source, and I understand Elasticsearch isn't really open source anymore. So yeah, great question. Thanks for asking it. Did I address it? Yes. Great, thanks. So I kind of have a bit of a part two to that one, because you, su you suggested was it open search. Uh, what about uh, look into alternatives like ClickHouse or something like that? Because I've seen a number of flow analyzer products use uh, ClickHouse, and they because it's, you don't need to have all the extensive hardware to run, you know, an ES cluster. What's a QuickHouse? Oh, the the database system that was done by uh, Yandex, the Russian search. Uh, oh, Yandex. Russian search, yeah. Okay, I'm not and familiar with it. So it kind of has like a bit of a MySQL-ish system and whatnot. It's just they've got just a, just a fast database engine, and mm -hmm. that can handle those kinds of queries where you can scan millions and millions of rows within like 250 milliseconds, something like that. That sounds impressive. I should look into that. Merge quick. trees, partitions, the whole bit. So okay, just yeah. like quick house? Yeah, just click house. Oh, word. click, click. Yeah. Click house. Okay, spell, English spelling -E of house? C-K-H-O-U-S-E. Awesome. Thanks. I'll, I'll take a look into that. All right. Any other questions I can address? Okay. If not, then thank you all very, very much for your time today.